So welcome to this afternoon session. I'm Jill Shapira. Uh, before retiring from UCLA's Behavioral Neurology Program a few years ago, I started a nurse practitioner program management clinic for persons with FTD and their care partners. I'm grateful for all they taught me, and I thank them. And let me do this first, too. Sorry, I just had cataract surgery, and I'm like trying to figure out. Oops. Um, I currently serve on AFTD Partners in Care Committee, along with Sue Hirsch and Sandy Groh. Uh, we develop educational materials for both family partners and health professionals. Examples of some of these partners in care newsletters and cases that we've written are uh, in your resources, in the handout. We're going to mention it a few times because I've learned from many of the people I've worked with how helpful those are to them. As a quick way of getting to know you, with a show of hands, how many of you are family care partners? How many are health providers? And are there any persons with FTD in the audience? Welcome to all of you. We know, and we've heard this morning, that FTD is a neurological disease of the frontal lobe resulting in profound changes in personality, in personality and behavior, both for the individual with the disease and the care partner. Today we present a big picture strategy um, to help individuals manage the challenges that occur with FTD. So rather than focus on very specific behaviors, we're, we're going to present an overview, an umbrella term that we hope you can use for a variety of challenges that are associated with the disease for you. We hope that the methods we discuss can be used and applied to changing symptoms and needs over time. I, I found working with families, having a plan, an overarching framework, allows any of us, all of us, to reduce feeling overwhelmed when a problem arises. Our aims are to help you identify problematic behaviors in behavior variant FTD, understand the importance of non-pharmacological interventions, behavioral interventions, environmental modifications, learn principles of the problem-solving approach in both the home and the residential care setting, and become familiar with the resources. Again, AFTD has wonderful resources, and we've listed a few in the booklet. As Dr. Mendes discussed this morning and um, some of our speakers this afternoon, in order to diagnose FTD, three or more of the symptoms must be present to make the, the diagnostic classification for FTD. Um, we've, we've talked about them this morning. I'm not going to go over them in detail. One of the most important things I learned from patients and families was the sheer variety of behaviors that can be sub subsumed under each of these things. So, for example, um, I recall some of my, the, the individuals I worked with, uh, and I was thinking about compulsive behaviors and how the different ways that they expressed their, or acted out the compulsive behaviors. One man would wake up early every morning when the sun came up, um, ran to his neighbor's homes, and rang the doorbell along the block. And he had to do this every morning. Um, obviously, they were not the, the most well-liked family on the block. Um, Another woman I worked with had a compulsive behavior in that she would only eat very, very specific foods, and she kept a list. And she had to arrange these foods on her plate in a very, very specific way. She was one of my research patients, and so I took her for lunch to the UCLA cafeteria during lunchtime, the hospital cafeteria, and we went to the salad bar. 
I probably didn't think that through. Um, and she, and, but it was, I watched how carefully she looked at each piece of lettuce to make sure there wasn't a carrot shred in it. And she arranged them very carefully on her plate. Um, I turned around behind me and there was a line of at least 30 pe people waiting to get their waiting to get their meal. But that's how she exhibited compulsive behavior associated with her FTD. And one gentleman would walk down the street taking a walk with his with his spouse and needed to shake every car that they that they came to. He saw the car, he was disinhibited and had a need, a compulsion to go over and shake that car. Many of those cars had car alarms. So those were all, ex these are examples of um, challenges that are associated with FTD. And the actions of the individuals are unique. And that's, again, what I thank my families for teaching me and my patients, and that we need to address the behaviors. We need to look at them individually and come up with unique individual um, approaches to solve the problems. Overview, overlap of these symptoms, the disinhibition, the apathy, all of these things, all of these um, symptoms of the disease overlap, and they can change over time. And it makes it more complex to come up with a problem-solving approach. And we're gonna talk about ways to address that. Understandably, care partners experience anger and frustration because of these behaviors. In addition to the sadness that's intertwined always as their loved ones change um, from their former selves. In my experience, lack of insight about their illness and need for help and loss of empathy about how others feel are particularly difficult for family members. This directly impacts how care partners manage challenges. So the emotional approach, the, the person with, I can't work the thing that points. The emotional approach, so persons with FTD have symptoms. It's not their fault, they have behaviors. Caregivers have emotions because of the behaviors. It's not their fault, they're, ne they're normal, we understand them. It's this intersection between the patient behavior and how the caregiver emotional approach can impact that, those behaviors we're going to address today. The impact, the way that the caregivers manage their own feelings um, can, can help the behavior, help resolve the behavior, or it can make it worse. So we're gonna ask you throughout our presentation to think about ways how your emotions may be impacting the person's behavior. So for example, um, remember that no amount of reasoning will help individuals understand they have a disease and have changed. You can talk to your blue in the face, it's not gonna help. And try to avoid what I call personalizing. Your loved one is not doing things to get you. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It feels that way, we understand it. It's normal that you're feeling that way, but that's, that's not gonna help solve a problem. Always consider the tone of your voice, your body language, and facial expressions. This can be particularly important when the person has um, a communication or language component to the, to the illness, where we, where we pay attention more to nonverbal communication. And always remember, think, take a step back, take the five breaths. Are your actions helping or making the situation worse. People always ask, what about medications? You know, is there a pill that can make these things go away? Um, behavioral interventions, problem solving approach, environmental modifications are generally more effective at managing behaviors than any medicine we have now. We don't have a medication right now, 
to stop or slow the progression of FTD. Not yet. We do have medications. They're generally psychiatric uh, behavior modifying uh, medications that can be used, but in conjunction with the non-pharmacological behavior management strategies we're going to talk about. So if we cannot manage a behavior without medications, we can use medications, but always in conjunction with what we're going to talk about. Okay, so kind of to, to sum up this overview, I'm giving an overview. These are the general considerations when using a problem-solving approach. Behavioral changes overlap and change over time. The action that you see from the, in, from the person with the disease are complex. To make solutions manageable, separate the challenges, figure out what's important, and address them one at a time. Recognize that FTD is a brain disease and set realistic expectations about what the person can do. Contact your medical team if a behavior is unsafe for the person or the family members or staff members. Um, or if you think that a behavior might be related to illness, pain, or changes in medication. That should always come at the forefront of your thinking. Was there a new medication that was added? It can be for blood pressure. It can be for asthma. You know, was anything new added? Could my loved one be in pain? You know, could there be a dental problem? That, that's a big source that I've seen of, of behavioral issues. Acknowledge ways that care partners, either at, in the home or in facilities, and interact with the affected person. Pay attention to the way you're, to how you are feeling emotionally. Think through what is effective and what is not. And remember, we're not saints. Uh, get support and help from others, from your family, from support groups, and from the AFTD. Okay, so we've, I've given you a general approach of why we want to teach problem solving. These are the specific methods we're going to discuss. First, define the challenging behavior. Be as specific as you can. The symptoms overlap. Choose the behavior. Make it as simple as possible for you to work on. Then assess the safety risks and medical issues. Brainstorm all possible solutions. Be as creative as you can. Then you evaluate the options and you choose one. You choose the one that you think will work. Then you create a, a plan and then you evaluate it. Did it work? Did it make things better? Did it make things worse or did things stay the same? And then you try again. So let's use this approach to solve a problem. This is one of my patients from a, a while ago. Jim was diagnosed with behavior variant FTD two years ago at the age of 56. He lives at home with his wife Susan of 30 years. While Jim previously followed a healthy diet and enjoyed physical activity, playing golf weekly, and exercising three times a week at a gym, he recently refused to do most things, preferring to stay at home, watching television, and playing video games. One of the first symptoms Susan noticed was Jim's increase in carbohydrates, especially sweets. A recent visit with his internist revealed an eight pound weight gain over six months and a significant increase in his blood glucose level, leading to a diagnosis of prediabetes. The physician suggested decreasing carbohydrates, especially sweets, and increasing exercise. If Jim's glucose level continued to rise, he would need to start medicine for diabetes. Jim and Susan go grocery shopping together once a week. During their last trip, Jim insisted they buy seven small packages of Milano cookies, those mint Milano cookies in the little package, so he could eat an entire one every evening while he was watching Jeopardy. When Susan explained he could no longer eat so many sweets and put most of the, the packages back on the shelf, 
Jim pushed her away, became angry, and threw the seven packages in their cart. So Sandy Grow will now detail a problem-solving approach using this case example. seems kind of simple, and I know it, isn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't appear that simple when you're in the middle of it. I'm Sandy. My background is a nurse, but my specialty was the operating room. We fixed things. We sent them out. We had a lot of problem solving that went on, but the problem solving was really a lot different when it came to dementia. That wasn't my specialty. So this was what I um, have kind of a passion about is to give you a tool that you can kind of use as you go away. So we're defining one specific behavior, and we may concentrate a little bit on the eating behavior because that is a common thing that happens among all of it. I may mention some uh, other behaviors or some other examples. Please don't go away waiting for the other shoe to drop. Every behavior that you hear about does not happen to every person. Um, the specific behavior this time is a food behavior. The overlapping behavior is that he's unaware that that's really a problem. Um, you, you might look at the frequency of the behavior. If it is a compulsive behavior, how often is it happening? What are some of the triggers? Is there an environmental trigger? Is it worse eating behavior when they're in the kitchen? Um, is, the, is it a time of day? Is it when you sit down to watch the television? I know in my house, to go to the, from the television to the back of the house, you're always going through the kitchen. <laughs> um, are there other individuals that you need to um, share the plan with? Um, previous strategies to manage the behavior. Well, obviously, the first strategy that she learned, she tried was telling him no. The doctor said you, you shouldn't have these sweets, and we can see how well that worked out for her. He didn't understand, and that's what he was going to do. Now, you look at the degree of concern. Is it a concern that he gained weight? There are some people that say, listen, he's got this disease. It's going to progress. Let him have what he wants. But let me propose to you that it may... Weight gain does affect the disease over the time. It is a decision how much you live, and we have discussed this in support group. However, weight gain does lead later on to um, harder care, um, skin folds, other issues, diabetes affecting your blood pressure, and now you've got a person with two problems. Um, not only will your food budget and your clothing budget be out of line, but you need to think about what it is that you want to do. There's also medical concerns. As his gl blood glucose goes up, you can't tell me that he feels well. When people ask me about, well, should I keep his regular medications, it's always a good idea to make sure that medically they're tuned up because you know yourself when you have a bad day and you're not feeling well, you don't think as well. So that it can temper the behaviors to keep your medical issues under check. Um, and always um, consider the emotional impact on the caregiver and the staff. Uh, there are some times when you make a suggestion to a caregiver or a staff member and they say, well, I could never do that. Sometimes we have tried to teach people to um, fool them a little bit or tell a little white lie and they say, oh, I would never do that. But, and you have to acknowledge that their feelings are their feelings and never, um, criticize them for what they're feeling, but try to understand. Do they understand the disease? Are they educated about it? Um, the next thing that you're going to consider is the um, physical safety. You know, we've heard about that in some of the other lectures. Safety is one of the most important things. When you have a wanderer, are they safe? Are they watching when they cross the street? Um, is there something else that that you need to have. With eating behaviors, um, there can be problems with safety. Are they eating too quickly? That can lead to choking. Are they grabbing or reaching for hot food? Sometimes they're just not aware of the surroundings. Um, are they, I had one of the rare um, people that ate non-food items, and when I was particularly upset about that, I called back to the clinic and they said, one of the first things you do is keep non-food items out of any food area. Um, we had to remove napkins from the table and uh, use cloth. 
So there are sometimes are simple answers. Um, don't leave anything that's uh, the f fake fruit out, some of those, those things that you can consider. Um, are they safe using the stove anymore? There may be e issues that you need to do not to allow them to use the stove, not to use the stove or the microwave. Sometimes they get into these compulsive behaviors and I want to tell you 10 minutes, putting popcorn in the microwave for 10 minutes takes a long time to get the smell out of the house. So, you know, then you know that that's probably not something you want them doing. Um, you need to consider the physical safety of others. Never should you be in fear for yourself or someone else. There are times when you do have to call for someone to help you. Um, they, they, we do, they do try to tra train the EMS and um, police to understand dementia. You should never fear in in, for yourself. And if someone is threatening, do call for help. Don't draw the line and say, well, maybe I'll call next time, or this is important this time. Um, like Jill said, sudden changes may signal an illness. I hadn't thought of dental issues, but that's a, that's a very real one. A urinary tract infection, um, a decrease in their mental, mental illness. That could mean that there's something else other than FTD. Think about some of the things that we might add every day. We might add a cold pill. You know, we're, some of those things might interact. Everyone acts differently to different antibiotics. So consider that if there is a sudden change in contact, the medical team as necessary. Some of the things that are fun is to list all the ideas, as many creative ideas as you can get to. One of the ideas was um, to call the company and find out if they could make a smaller bag. That didn't go over well. So um, people started throwing out ideas, and it wasn't long before they realized that he had memory. That was not the problem. He knew he wanted seven bags. He knew what day it was. He knew how many were left. They finally realized that he counted the bags, but he didn't count the cookies inside the bag. So they started, one of the ideas was to open up the bag and remove a few of the cookies each time so that he wouldn't notice the cookies were down. So were they able to eliminate the behavior or was it a issue of maybe tempering it and maybe he did have to go on vacation for a short period, or go on medication for a short period of time for his diabetes. Um, but sometimes the approach is right there in front of you. Um, so be creative as possible. Um, I'm always a big one about evaluating your approach, and Jill touched on this, because I myself did not have a poker face. If something happens, you can read it all over, if I've got a good hand or not a good hand. So watch your tone of voice, the volume of your voice. Um, when you're go getting to the evaluation part at the end of the day and wondering why it didn't work, um, even saying something nice while you're standing there with your hands on your hips probably is not a good idea, and I'm a big one to cross my arms. So body language and facial expression should all, should all count. Um, ask family and friends and your support group and the helpline for suggestions. Um, one person had a husband that um, had um, behaviors where he would touch everything, perseveration and touching that. That's a common behavior. They were driving down the road and he opened the door to the car on the highway. She was, well, what do I do with that? When his brother said, why don't you see if he'll sit in the back seat and put the child locks on? And she's like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Well, sometimes you're so tied up in the behavior, you don't think of some of this, the problems and the issues. So it is a good idea to find a support group, find friends, and get everybody on board. Um, we're going to, Sue will talk more about how the residential staff gets together and how do they communicate. And we have a lot of um, FTD resources out there. We'll probably mention partners in care till you go home dreaming about it. <laughs> But the best way that I tell people to find it is um, up at the top of the website. There's a thing that says, for professionals, don't believe that. 
click on that and one of the options is partners in care. When you click on that, it brings up the whole list of behaviors. Those are all the things that we've covered. And what's nice about it for the caregiver is that there is always a section of what to do about. So it kind of gives a lot of these hints that people have come up with over time. So that's a quick way to go to it and find out um, some things to solve a problem. So like Jill said, you're gonna weigh the pros and cons of each possible solution, asking what's best for the person. Um, you're gonna eliminate alterna alternatives that are not manageable. Keep in mind that when you take something away without a substitute, that's when the anger comes on. So you're trying to think of a redirection, uh, some other thing that you can propose to them. This one says create a lit written plan. When you're home, this seems a little excessive. Why would I write things down? I encourage a lot of people even to keep a calendar. You might, it doesn't have to be a journal. It could be a date book. It could be the calendar on, uh, that you flip over and say, this is when this thing started. It helps you to talk to the next caregiver. Suppose you have a family member coming over and you wanna say, you know, in the last few days, we've had to use some bathroom reminders. It reminds you to tell them so that in between caregivers, it goes smoothly. It also helps you when you go to the doctors to say, this is what I'm seeing the next time you can compile some of it. And usually they ask you to tell them what your most important and your biggest concern is. And then you're gonna look at, was the solution effective? Did the behavior stay the same or get somewhat better? So as people give you a suggestion, you um, are tell, asking them to um, uh, say, well, it did change. You know, sometimes you can't eliminate the behavior totally, but can we get it under control? Somebody that goes out and walks and walks and walks, can we cut it down to one walk a day? Can you use a friend that would take him out once and then you take him out? And the evaluation part is really some of the most important. When you're sitting down, sometimes right in the middle of it, you don't understand what, what went wrong. But when you sit down, you uh, may be able to take a look at your tone of voice, take a look at how you put it into practice and see if it worked. I have a couple of other examples, and they did mention about scams. Um, we had a gentleman who, was, who got involved in internet scams, and we had a caregiver mentioning the caregiver's feelings, their family dynamics. She never said no. She couldn't say, her husband always had the money. She felt uncomfortable telling him. She felt uncomfortable taking control of the bank accounts. Her daughters were appalled that he had lost money. So she, when she was at support group, her daughters dragged her to support group, and we talked about the, probably the ultimate goal was to get um, guardianship, and then she would feel better. We all know that that takes a while. So what kind of things did the girls suggest in between? Notifying the bank. The bank is very aware that there are scams going on and they, can know what, they know what to do. As soon as the bank was notified, they changed some bank account numbers, they changed um, the credit card, and he, didn't, he no longer had access. Well, once he found out he didn't have access to his credit card, he wanted a credit card. They talked about um, blocking phone numbers on the phone, using an only allowed phone numbers, uh, putting parental controls on the computer, um, and um, getting him a card that only had a very small limit. And then the one thing and the most important thing that made her more comfortable was that she didn't say no to him. She said to him, you know that last money that you invested? When that money pays off, we'll reinvest it. It's probably not going to stop his obsession of finding the next get-rich-quick scheme, but she felt comfortable continuing to say the same thing. It did promote another behavior as he tried to ask other people for money. But if you tell people what's going on, 
until you get that guardianship. Um, and she was, she did eventually become more comfortable with um, having a smaller bank account for him and gaining control of the money herself. Um, we had another um, person that, through unfortunate incidents, lost his license. The woman came to support group and she was just thrilled. It wasn't her that took his way as license. He can't blame me. And we all said, well, good. I'm glad that worked out for you. No one was hurt. He doesn't have his license. He can't drive anymore. Well, guess what? By the next visit, a month later, she's saying all he talks about is getting someplace. All, you know, you have a young person with no job, lots of time on their hands, very active. He wanted to go to the exercise facility. So her first thought was, I decided to get him the Uber app. So she got him an Uber app, and she tried to use it, and he couldn't use it. So then her next idea in the whole evaluation plan and deciding, she thought, well, I'll just use the Uber app, and I'll order the card for him. So she ordered the car for him, but then the car that comes doesn't always come exactly on time. It doesn't always look like the same car. Um, so when she came to support group, she was pretty tired. And we talked to her about public transportation. And in Summit County, I'm from Ohio, and in Summit County, they have a st Summit County area transport, and it's called SCAT. Kind of an unusual <laughs> acronym. And we talked to her about signing up for it. It seemed to work. This is why we thought maybe it did work. She calls a day ahead and she tells him what time and she sets a timer and he can watch for that to come. It takes him to his, his um, exercise place and then she picks him up after work. The van that arrives is easily identifiable. It's a van or a car and it's easily identifiable. Remember, people with FTD function much better with a routine. Anytime you can keep them in a routine. Um, dressing and bathing, we've all, there are some people that are just not going to do that. And in this case, it was um, a, uh, the caregiver who was very upset about her mother who was very prim and proper and she wasn't dressing and bathing and her hair was a mess. We talked about different ideas, you know, making the steps simpler and making sure the water was good and she tried all kinds of things and then her hairdresser was looking for a makeover couple. And her, she perked right up and she said, would you put our pictures on the internet, on your website? And she said, sure, I'd do that. So they picked a time when the hairdresser was not busy, there was not a lot of noise, and she pulled her mother out of the house who didn't want to go, and they both looked fancy when they got done. And they took the picture and put it on the internet and it's funny now that her mom, she said they agreed that they wouldn't have to bathe every day, but now her mom will say to her, is today shower day? Does my hair look good? Will it last forever? I don't know. But that particular thing, she came up with that herself. And you know, when you come to a support group with a success, everybody loves it. Everybody just um, cheers. And I thought about um, Jill's example of the gentleman that was touching the car alarms. And if you think uh, touching the cars and making the alarm go off, this issue has been brought up before. And what they talked, I, I heard that at a, another talk, and what they talked the gentleman into doing, they told him, um, you know, really what you should be doing is examining the cars. So they gave him a clipboard and a checklist and sent him down the scent and said, what you do is you check and look, see are the tires okay and whatever, but you don't touch the car. It worked for a while. You know, you, you, like you said, you're not a popular. So sometimes those things work and sometimes they don't, but throw in the pot, everything that you can think of and pull out the things that might work. And please share your successes with everyone. Unfortunately, Susan developed bone cancer and needed urgent surgery and hospitalization. Jim was admitted to a residential care facility um, with experience in FTD. The administrator visited Susan before surgery to try and better understand Susan's issues. So residential care presents a whole new group while you're trying to make this person with FTD fit in. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joe and Sandy. It's the first time I used a microphone. I'm pretending like I'm Bruce Springsteen or something. With the, I don't know if he does that. Okay. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sue Hirsch. I'm the Education and Development Specialist for HCR Manor Care's Memory Care Communities. And some of my responsibilities include developing and presenting training to all of our staff that's required and also developing and implementing um, specialized dementia services for our residents and for our families. Um, so, and then I'm also been since I think 2011, a partner in the FTD care. So have definitely learned a lot from the association. So we wanna return to the journey of Jim and Susan with FTD. Um, so prior to Jim moving into the residential care community, the administrator met with Susan, which is very, very important. And the purpose of that visit was to gain information from Susan on Jim's history and also what his needs are. And a tool that I really recommend families to use is called the Daily Care Snapshot Tool. And on this slide, you'll see just the very beginning of this tool. It's an excellent tool that you can download off of the AFTD's website. Um, you can see just in the beginning some information that Susan could share with the staff, like Jim's accomplishments. Also, who were the key people in his life, family and friends? What was the role of Susan as his caregiver in the past and also present? Some other information that family and friends caregivers can share are things like, what was his routine at home? What are some of Jim's caregiving needs? What kind of approaches they use? Were there any safety considerations? What kind of approaches they use for that? It's a really, really excellent tool to use. And again, I really recommend our families to um, fill that out and then to sh we share it with our staff prior to the person moving into a residential care community because it really provides a baseline of information about that person. Okay. So Jim has now been in the residential community for about seven days. And during that time, some of the observations that the staff have had about his behaviors, um, Jim's been wandering constantly around the community, which is not unusual because this is a new setting for him. Um, he has been invited to group programs, but he really hasn't shown any interest in them. And he has also tried to eat other residents' food during meal times, and he is constantly taking snacks that they have around the community in bowls and baskets. The staff have tried to redirect him, but they have not always been successful. So at this point, the team is getting together again. Jim's been in the community for seven days now, and they're gonna have a team meeting, and they're gonna implement the problem-solving approaches that Jill and Sandy described. And just as a disclaimer, um, 12 years ago, I was an administrator at one of our memory care communities, and we had a resident come in who had Pick's disease. Um, new person, we never had that diagnosis before. Um, she had gained 75 pounds at home. She lived on XX large bags of M&Ms. Um, I'm a chocolate. Yes, I'm a chocolate, I'm looking at cannabis. Yes, I'm a chocolate addict, but that's all that she would eat. And when she came to our community, our approach back then was we really didn't know what to do to help her. It was medications, and also we locked all the cabinets, all the refrigerators, and we kept saying no because we wanted to keep her safe. Guess what happened? Metal locks in the refrigerator. This is a woman, even with 75 pounds, still was a pretty small woman. She broke all the locks off the cabinets, off the refrigerator. So when I was asked to be part of this, I was really glad to do this because we have learned so much more. I wish that we would have had the problem solving approaches back then for Miss Janine because we would have been more successful in helping her. Um, but yeah, she actually broke the locks off the cabinets and the refrigerator. So at the team meeting, they're implementing now the problem solving approaches. And a couple things that they're looking at, again, looking at the daily care snapshot tool looking at the behaviors that Susan shared that Jim had at home. And some things that she shared was that, you know, things that he used to enjoy, like exercising, golfing, those types of things, he, never, he doesn't have that interest anymore. Also, his compulsiveness, 
particularly with sweets, cookies, that was a very dominant behavior that he had at home. And now that he's been in the care setting, the staff, they're documenting, they're observing. He is wandering throughout the community. Um, he has not shown an interest in the group programs he's been invited to. And the compulsive eating seems to be really a priority behavior for them to focus on. And again, part of that is he is trying to take residents' food at meal times and also eating many, many snacks. Um, possible triggers, when they looked at that, you know, this is a new environment for him, so we are going to see probably some new behaviors. That's not atypical when somebody moves into a new residential care community. Um, also, group dining. When he sees other people eat, he sees the food, he smells the food. Those are cues that it's now time to eat for him. The communal snacks are throughout the whole community, so it's very easy for him. He can grab, um, it'd be nice if he grabbed the bananas, but there's also all kinds of cookies and candies out there, so he's grabbing those constantly. The other residents, he sees the other residents eating. Again, that's a cue for him to eat. And as Susan saw, the staff are also seeing that his behaviors are more frequent in the evening hours. Let's see. A couple other things. They also looked at the daily care snapshot tool to see what did Susan do to try to help Jim with these behaviors. A couple things that she shared, she tried to explain to Jim, you know, he can't continue to eat the cookies because he was gaining weight. His blood sugar levels were getting high. He was now pre-diabetic. Um, she also tried to limit his watching TV, particularly Jeopardy, because that seemed to be a trigger for him, and also consulted with their physician. The degree of concern for Jim now at the, this point at the residential care community still is pretty moderate. We're still kind of concerned about his health issues, but also there's some safety issues, and I'll talk about that in a minute with his interactions with some of the other residents. The emotional impact some of the other residents and families now are voicing some concerns and frustrations because Jim is trying to take their food off their plates and also he's taking snacks that everybody else enjoyed. The staff, although they've had a lot of experience with FTD, they are expressing some frustration because Jim is needing constant redirection and supervision. So in identifying the problem, again, the priority one that they're looking at at this point is his compulsive eating. And then we go to step two. You know, we want to assess the risk. What's the risk of Jim and his compulsive eating and, again, taking food from other residents? At this point, we have to look at the physical safety of both Jim and the other residents. At this point, we've had some verbal altercations because some of the residents are not happy that Jim is trying to take their food, particularly their desserts at mealtimes. Um, concern about his medical illness. He has gained five pounds, so he has really, really taken a lot of snacks throughout the community. And we've also seen an increase in his blood glucose levels. The te medical team has also been advised, so we have advised the attending physician. He has had a weight gain. His labs have increased, and also his behaviors. Then we go to the brainstorming. So as a team, the team came together. And we really want to share, you know, what can we do to help Jim? And in preparation for this meeting, again, that happened seven days post Jim moving in, the administrator did a couple of things. Um, she shared the daily care snapshot tool with all of the staff so that they are aware of his past history. Also, she went on the AFTD website. And on there, there I go again, the partners in FTD care. But looking at, there's 25 newsletters there. And she selected two that she thought would really help the staff. One is on behavioral variant FTD, which is the diagnosis that Jim has. And also, she downloaded, there's a newsletter on there about compulsive behaviors, particularly eating. So she shared that also with the staff. Also, in the meeting room, she has evil side post-its so that she can write down everybody's suggestions. And that's one key. When I do training with staff, I say, you know, if there is a behavior, there's a situation, it's really important for everybody to share their ideas. Because no idea, unless we try it, and you heard from um, Sandy, like, you hear some of these ideas, and you're like, really, where did that come up with? But a lot of times, you've got to really go outside the box and look at some possible solutions that may help that person. 
So some of the things that they came up with is to post a daily schedule. You know, we've heard that throughout the day. Routine is very effective for many people with FTD. So they came up with posting a daily schedule that they're going to post in Jim's room, and that includes things that he used to enjoy, like group exercise, golfing, specific times for meal times, and a 1 p.m. snack that includes four cookies. Escort Jim to the dining room after everyone else is done eating. Also to provide Jim with a seat that's near an exit. And in a residential care community, I've seen that's also been very helpful because if the person gets overwhelmed, they can leave very easily, or if the staff needs to redirect that person, they can have an easy exit there. Um, also to continue to educate the staff on behavioral variant FTD. A couple other things, to have the administrator meet individually with residents and families who have concerns about Jim's behaviors. Try to discourage him watching TV, especially in the evening. Encourage him to attend like exercise groups, trivia programs, those are interests that he had in the past. Disguise community snacks. So their thought was to buy um, non-clear like rubber containers that have a twist off lid and put the snacks in there. That way Jim doesn't see them and then he has to have an extra snap step to actually get to the snacks which again is accessible to the other residents but for Jim he's not going to see them as much. Um, offer to Sandy to have a private duty companion like three o'clock to eight o'clock at night because that seems to be his most active time. Try to explain to Jim you know as he's constantly looking for cookies that we ran out of snacks we ran out of cookies but instead we have jello. Limit his access to magazines that may have pictures of food. Again, that's a visual cue for him. And also to consult with the physician. So after that, the team looked at each one of those approaches and they really just looked at those to see which is gonna be best for Jim, which is best for the residential community. And if there are any of them that they really thought wasn't going to be a manageable um, or realistic approach for Jim. And then, Number five is the written plan. So again, very, very important in any setting, like Sandy said, but particularly in a residential care community. So it's important to have the written plan and some of the things that they put on the written plan and then it was shared with everybody that works there. Whether you're a caregiver, a nurse, housekeeper, cook, programming, maintenance, everyone should be aware of the written plan so it's consistent for Jim. So some of the things they came up with the written plan, um, again, to post a daily schedule, and on there to include very specific meal times for Jim so that he knows when the meals are gonna be, the time for his PM snack, offer him four cookies in a sealed container, kind of like what, Sand, what Susan did in the home setting, gonna escort Jim to the dining room after everyone else has eaten, um, private video trivia games because that's something that he enjoys, and particularly during breakfast and lunchtime because they needed something for him to do while the other residents were eating. When they really looked at his active time, instead of asking Susan for five hours of a private duty companion, they, they brought it down to 4.30 to 7.30 because that is his most active time and that's the dinner time. And then store the communal snacks in an invisible container. A couple other things they, they found out, trying to argue or reason with Jim, like that, that did not work for him. Trying to explain to him if he ate another cookie, his blood sugars were gonna increase or he was gonna mean, gain more weight. Tried to substitute Jello for cookies, that didn't work either. So they took that one out. Um, redirecting Jim to video golf games. He still enjoyed that, he was a real golfer, so he enjoyed that. A family member brought in a scrapbook that has family pictures and labeled. And he really responded that to that also. And I found that with many of our individuals with FTD, they really do like the scrapbook. It has photos and labels, so he enjoyed that. If he started to get upset, instead of saying you can't eat cookies because you're gonna gain weight, instead they would bring the scrapbook out. Report any, and I put negative in quotations, so any behaviors like the verbal altercation, resident to resident, gem with other residents, we want to report that to the administrator immediately. And if any of the residents or families have concerns, again, we want to report that to the administrator. Jim has had family and friends who's been visiting him, so we want to encourage them to visit maybe before or after mealtimes. 
and report weekly weights and his blood glucose levels to the physician. And now that we have the plan, Jim's been with us for 30 days. And some things that we are looking at with his written plan and seeing where his status is at this point. He has improved, but we still see the afternoon, the p.m. time is still most active for him. Um, he has lost four pounds at this point, and his blood sugar seemed to be more stabilized, and his attending physician wants to observe that for another 30 days before he, he um, introduces any prescriptions for medications for Jim. The staff, still some periods of frustration, but the administrator is very supportive, the team is very supportive, and they feel very positive that they're seeing some improvement with Jim at this point. As far as the plan, they're gonna to continue to look at the plan, but right now the plan's working for Jim, so they're gonna keep that, make sure everybody's doing the same thing. Um, ask Susan to continue with the private duty because that's been very helpful. And with Susan being in rehab now, you know, Jim's been there 30 days, and probably his care is now extended. So the plan is like every week for the team to have many meetings, look at the written plan, look at Jim's behaviors, observe what's working, what isn't working. Like I said, it's evaluate, review, and try again. So that's the plan that we, we found for Jim. And throughout the time, we talked about some of the resources. Um, you'll see the AFTD website. That's where you can find the daily care snapshot tool. And again, not, not to be like a QVC person or something, but that is one of the most valuable tools. I download that and give that to every family member and ask them to please, please, please provide that information for us because it's wonderful information to share with staff, whether it's home health care, respite, rehab, um, or in this case, residential care. Um, you'll see the helpline. Great, I call them a lot. <laughs> you know, um, like I said, I'm in a lot of residential communities, memory care communities, and I call them a lot for help for families. I refer families to them a lot also. You'll see some of the partners in FTD care newsletters. And if you don't find a topic or something you have a concern about, you don't see a newsletter there and you're like, oh gosh, I wish they would have written that newsletter, please contact us So, because we're always very interested in new topics for new newsletters. And also on the AFTD website, um, there are some webinars, there are fantastic webinars that you can download to listen to. A couple additional resources, the National Institute on Aging, and there's also the Savvy Caregiver Program which is a six-week program that's designed for people who are providing care for someone with Alzheimer's disease or related disorder. And they also have some very good online information also if you can't go to the six-week course. So that, that kind of run, runs the gamut through the journey with Susan and Jim through a home health setting to residential care. So I think we do have some time for questions. If anyone has some questions, we can help you all with. Please feel free. So, how do you find a facility? You know, sorry, how do you find a facility that is familiar with FTD? We're finding it not as easy as one might think, and your, your slide makes it seem like, oh, you know, you could find a place with FTD experience. So, and 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 again, you know, the places that have memory care, which is what we're looking at for my sister, they're like, oh yeah, we send our, you know, we send all our caregivers. You know, That's, I mean, that's, that's, a very, that's a very hard challenge and a very good question. And we, we've had, oh. Sorry, the question was, how do you find a The question is, how do you find a facility that specializes in FTD and understands some of the problems that we've addressed? And even though a facility says, yes, we know how to take care of dementia patients, they're usually thinking about Alzheimer's disease and it's not dementia. So the question is, how do you find a facility? You work in a facility that is specialized in this. And I'd say through time, um, you know, I work for ECR Manor Care and our memory care communities. We have a whole variety of different dementias that we provide care for. And I'd say when we started out, we really worked with families and the association to learn more about the disease. Um, you know, 
some of the communities, I would say families have told me that they've also had to be kind of the educator when they go into a memory care community. Like a lot of places never had somebody move in that had FTD or some of the other dementias. And that's where, again, I would reach out to the AFTD, um, the association, and say, you know, I found a community, but they don't have experience with FTD, and to provide educational resources. So sometimes, unfortunately, the families have to be the educational resource. And also, I think, again, sharing the behaviors and making sure that that community is comfortable. Like, our communities, and I'm not here just to represent HR Manor Care, but, you know, we, we require all of our staff to go through training in not just Alzheimer's care, but we have a specialized program on like FTD and Lewy body and the other types of dementia. Um, and there's excellent, excellent educational resources that you can access through the AFTD to help the staff in the care. Yes, and we're fortunate to have you as an, and as an expert. But I, I worked in Los Angeles at UCLA. We have a huge variety of resources here, and it was extremely difficult, even with the hundreds of facilities we have, to, to find a place that would accept our patients, number one, because they were younger and deal with the behaviors. So, so and it's unfortunate, but what we're left with is put, putting it on the family who are already struggling with so many, you know, so many feelings about this placement. So one of the things that I think that I suggest that you do is talk to the, the physician who's working with the FTD or the nurse practitioner or the PA who's ever in your clinical team to call the facility, to spend 15 minutes talking to the director of nurses, sharing the material that we have through the AFTD, let the facility know that we will be there with you. To, I t promised every facility who took our patients, you have a problem, you call me. You know, have them call the physician, negotiate with the physician beforehand. This should not be on you, the families alone. It's, it's a team effort with the AFTD. But, but your role is going to be to add, to be a squeaky wheel with the physician team and say, look, I really need some help here. And would you be willing to answer some questions? Um, the other thing that I found, we have to stop then, and I'm talking because we're out of time. But Yes, for you. Um, so I, uh, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I work in a specialty center in Phoenix, but I run a support group, FTD support group, that is comprised of people from all over Arizona. They may or may not be patients that we see. So I would suggest that you find a support group in the area where your sister is, specific to FTD, and ask the other caregivers. Because they really, they've already walked your journey. Some of them have spent, you know, years already teaching facilities on and, and giving these resources, and they're really going to be the best resource that you have. People have already been there, done that. Okay. Um, we're out of time, but thank you very much for your, for the, I wish we had time for more questions, but there are question and answer sessions in the next series of, of workshops that I think are fully devoted to questions um, from the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you.